kill and confront the extremist movement of which J.D. Vance, unfortunately, is a part of, right? Who says that the President of the United States is intentionally trying to kill people with fentanyl? Who says that the election was stolen? J.D. Vance does. Who runs around with Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida, who wants to ban books? You're running around with Lindsey Graham, who wants a national abortion ban. You're running around with Marjorie Taylor Greene, who's the absolute looniest politician in America. This is a dangerous group, and we do need to confront it. I'm Sarah Kensier, the author of the bestsellers The View from Flyover Country and Hiding in Plain Sight, and of the new book, They Knew How a Culture of Conspiracy Keeps America Complacent, which is out now. I'm Andrea Chalupa, a journalist and filmmaker, and the writer and producer of the journalistic thriller Mr. Jones about Stalin's genocide famine in Ukraine. It's the film the Kremlin does not want you to see. They keep shutting down screenings. And this is Gaslit Nation, a podcast covering corruption in the United States and rising autocracy around the world. We're going to start this week's show with an overview of the Make It or Break It 2022 midterms. If you feel at any time a sense of ominous storm clouds during this conversation, head on over to Gaslit Nation's 2022 Survival Guide, which you can find on the homepage of our website, gaslitnationpod.com. It is your one-stop shop for all things 2022 midterms, where to get in to help get out the vote, events that we, the Gaslit Nation podcast, are co-hosting with a lot of wonderful groups like Sister District and Indivisible. And so it's really, really, really a critical time. So much is at stake. Kevin McCarthy just came out and said that if Republicans take over the House, that they're going to stop giving all this aid to Ukraine As we've always said on the show, Vladimir Putin's greatest ally in his fascist global takeover attempt, because Ukraine is on the front lines fighting for all of us, and Putin has been buying off politicians around the world, across Europe. His oligarchs have been pollinating his corruption in major institutions across Europe and the U.S. The Republican Party used to have like one or two freak show Republicans that were clearly the Kremlin candidates. Now the entire party is co-opted with Kremlin talking points. And now they're saying openly, they're very comfortable to say openly that they're going to turn off aid for Ukraine from the United States if if Republicans should take the House. That is going to empower Putin and allow his genocide, his extermination of the Ukrainian people. That's what he wants to do. He's been very clear on that point. He said it. He showed it. And so the genocide is going to be successful. The war is going to turn around in Putin's favor if the U.S. should turn off aid to Ukraine. President Biden will still be in power for two more years, but it's going to be harder to get what Ukraine needs in order to protect itself from an actual ongoing genocide. And as we know, the European Union has too many of these Kevin McCarthy types, these fringe far-right candidates that are also pulling the levers of power in Putin's direction. So the EU, without a strong US, isn't a reliable ally for Ukraine. Certainly I'm talking about Western Europe parts of Central Europe, Eastern Europe and the Nordic countries, they're strong. They're ride or die for Ukraine. So we're safe there. But without a strong U.S., a united NATO, a united global democratic alliance will be much harder to come by. We saw that under Trump, how hurt global democracies were with Trump in power causing all this chaos. And that was a very challenging time for Ukraine. The president was blackmailed, who was extorted by the president of the United States, right? So with Kevin McCarthy in power in the House, Putin is going to have a field day. It's going to be springtime for Putin, should that happen. So please join us in fighting like hell. Go to the Gaslit Nation pod website, gaslitnationpod.com. Check out the 2022 survival guide. I want to go down uh, with this with some of the events we're having, just so you can join us, join me personally. So we're going to be doing an important phone bank on October 25th, Tuesday, 5 p.m. Eastern with Sister District. 
calling uh, North Carolina voters for state races there. North Carolina is an important hub for abortion rights. A lot of women in the South whose states have banned abortion or really restricted it have been flooding to North Carolina to get abortion health care. So we need to protect abortion rights in North Carolina. So join us in making calls to voters in North Carolina on October 25th, Tuesday, 5 p.m. Eastern. I will be on that call with Sister District making phone calls with you. Then on October 28th, Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern time, we're doing a phone bank with Indivisible for U.S. Senate candidate John Fetterman in Pennsylvania. Sarah will be joining me. It's going to be mm-hmm. Halloween themed. Wear a funny hat, wear a funny T-shirt, wear whatever you want. Just join us for that important phone bank to help Democrats expand their majority in the U.S. Senate. Then on October 30th, Sunday at 1 p.m. Eastern, phone bank with Swing Left for Christy Smith for a U.S. House District in California. Christy Smith lost her last race in the same district by only 300 votes, 333 votes. That's how close it came. So if we can eke her through this time around, we can stand a chance of keeping fascist bootlicker Kevin McCarthy out of power in the House, okay? Then November 7th, Monday, 4 p.m. Eastern time, phone bank with Indivisible for U.S. Senate candidate Mandela Barnes in Wisconsin to unseat Kremlin stooge. What's his name? Johnson, the guy that spent uh, Fourth of July in Moscow that one one year. And then U.S. Rep. Lauren Underwood in Illinois. These are all critical races that we absolutely must win. If you want this information I just listed, go to GaslitNationPod.com and click on the Gaslit Nation 2022 Survival Guide. All this information is there and you can sign up. The links are there. Come join us. Make calls. Every little bit helps. Um, so I just wanted just to share uh, quickly, and we have wonderful research compiled by Gaslit Nation's associate producer, Carlin Daigle, who took a deep dive on the midterms to understand what we're up against. Thank you, Carlin. And here's what Carlin wrote. Andrea, I have to say that from doing this research, it's truly mind boggling how many election denying psychopaths have a path to victory in these races. And there you have it. This is not a drill. Fascism is here. Fascism has momentum. They're coming for us. And it's just going to get worse. The more of these guys are in power, they will use that advantage to further their reach. And little by little, month after month, it's just going to be shock and horror, right? Carlin provided this wonderful overview. There are 36 House Democrats not running for re-election. Of those, 14 seats are vulnerable. There are 28 House Republicans not seeking re-election. Only six of those seats are vulnerable. The key takeaways are redistricting has given Republicans a huge advantage and has made this election complicated, particularly in the South and Midwest, but it's an overall trend. I want to note that redistricting, meaning extreme Republican gerrymandering, could have been a lot worse than it actually turned out to be. But thanks to changing demographics, in some of these districts, Republicans couldn't be as aggressive as they wanted to be. And that's what saved us. It could have been a lot worse. And those demographics are going to continue to change rapidly. I mean, demographics are not destiny. People on the Democratic side, the party, Democratic Party side, the Stacey Abrams uh, organizing machine, everyone has to unite to try to ensure that those demographics go our way and that Republicans don't co-opt them. And so there's still work to be done. But so far, the changing demographics in America did disrupt Republicans' plans to do even more extreme gerrymandering. We got a bit lucky here. It could have been a lot worse. Almost every Republican candidate is a MAGA Republican. Democrats on a national level have not invested resources into more rural communities, and we'll find out after November 8th whether that's going to backfire. Democrats are running primarily centrist moderates who focus on bipartisan messaging against extremists, with very few exceptions. Literally every single Republican candidate either fully supports a national abortion ban or supports extreme restrictions on abortion. All but one identify openly as anti-abortion. All right, so that's very scary, right? All those handmade tale memes we've seen over the years since Trump first came to power, those are very on the nose. That's where we're headed. Uh, Some good news The very first day of early voting in Georgia were Senator Warnock and Stacey Abrams, two superstars in the front lines of defending our democracy. 
there on the ballot there. This very first day of early voting reached nearly the level of the first day of early voting in 2020. That's a huge surge of voters for a midterm election. And we all know how well Georgia did in 2020, turning blue for Biden and electing two Democratic senators when the pundits said it couldn't be done. Gabriel Sterling, the chief operating officer for Georgia's secretary of state, we all remember him as the guy who held the urgent press conference in 2020, calling on then President Trump to stop inciting violence and threatening the lives of poll workers, where Gabriel Sterling warned someone's going to get killed. And he was right. The harassment of poll workers was a prelude to Trump inciting violence in his attempted coup on January 6th, where people were killed. And once again, FBI Director Christopher Wray was warned, is all out in the open and did nothing, let it happen. Why is he still in power? On Monday, Gabriel Sterling wrote on Twitter, as of 4.15 p.m., we have seen over 100,000 Georgians cast their early vote. This blows away the previous midterm first day record of approximately 72,000. And we have lots of voting to go today. Uh, So that's huge, huge surge. Hopefully those numbers are all in our favor. That's a very good sign. Uh, When Democrats vote, we win, as we saw with the miracle in Kansas, the big vote to protect abortion rights in Kansas. So please join us make phone calls, knock on doors, donate what you can, make a plan to vote, make sure that you're registered, help others vote, volunteer as a poll monitor if it's not too late where you are, do everything you can now to help protect us from the worst. We can push back the tide of fascism. You could start today. Go to the Gaslit Nation 2022 Survival Guide at gaslitnationpod.com. All right. Well, thank you for that. And just to elucidate uh, that things can get worse um, and the horrors in store for us, especially if the GOP retakes the House, I'm going to start this segment, which is referenced in the title of our show today, Kanye Elon Trump, by discussing a tweet that was posted by the House uh, Judiciary GOP on October 6th that said exactly that, Kanye Elon Trump. And at the time, we didn't know why, but a strange series of events began to unfold shortly after surrounding this unholy trinity um, in a very reality TV style, WWE style way, um, as if part of a script. And so there's a lot going on uh, in terms of alliances and audiences for hate rhetoric, and we are going to break it all down today. We have decided to divide up the assholes, so I am going to take on Kanye and Trump, and Andrea is going to give us the latest on Kremlin mouthpiece and billionaire shitposter Elon Musk. Get ready, because none of this is fun, but I think it's important. Um, I think we need to study this, because this is the uh, direction of the future in terms of public discourse and monopolies over uh, public conversations. So here we go. On Sunday, Kanye West decided to uh, make the following tweet where he says, I'm a bit sleepy tonight, but when I wake up, I'm going death con three on Jewish people. The funny thing is I can't actually be anti-Semitic because black people are actually Jew too. You guys have toyed with me and tried to blackball anyone who opposes your agenda. And so this tweet was removed shortly after because it violated uh, Twitter rules against hate speech. And the tweet arrived after Kanye had worn a White Lives Matter t-shirt at a Paris fashion show, after he had gone on Tucker Carlson's show to express extreme right-wing views. Um, And some of his disparaging comments about Jewish people were actually edited out uh, by Carlson's show. Uh, They were too overt but they were leaked in videos to Vice. It was a week which culminated in Kanye announcing that he intends to purchase the social media website Parler, which is a favorite chat site uh, for white supremacists and Trump supporters. And it is currently owned by a man named George Farmer, who is the husband of notorious Trump supporter Candace Owens. And so all of these moves dovetailed with Trump uh, posting anti-Semitic rhetoric of his own on his own uh, social media network, Truth Social, shortly after. I'm going to get to that in a second. But to take the broad view, 
What we are seeing here are tools of autocrats attempting to purchase the digital public sphere. Kanye and Elon Musk are functioning as intermediaries for autocratic power players, much as oligarchs and plutocrats have traditionally done, and as they've done before in the United States. We've seen this with Peter Thiel, uh, for example, and he's you know making moves now as well. That these two men are obnoxious and cartoonish does not make them less dangerous. It actually makes them more dangerous because they understand the social media landscape and the attention economy much in the way that Trump did. And they know how to dominate it with rhetoric on the road to sealing it up with money. They understand that these days fascism sells and fascism is backed by powerful corporate and political operatives, which I'll get to in a minute. But the first thing that we need to emphasize is the rise in anti-Semitism, including physical attacks on Jewish Americans and on synagogues and on other gathering places, and the general streamlining of political violence since 2016 and especially uh, since 2020. When Kanye West says that he wants to, quote, go DEFCON 3 on Jewish people, that is an anti-Semitic threat. It is an incitement to violence toward a people who have a history of genocide. This is unequivocal. You know, you should note Kanye is not criticizing or targeting a particular individual in this tweet. He is targeting, in his own words, all Jewish people. And so, you know, there should be no prevaricating about this, regardless of some of his other comments. And so what prompted this outburst? Well, you need to look at the history here. Kanye has, for years, been building alliances with right-wing extremists, most notably with Trump, but especially uh, with Jared Kushner. The topic of Kushner was actually raised on Tucker Carlson's show, where Kanye asserted that Kushner had inaugurated these Middle East policy deals, um, these so-called Abraham Accords, for personal profit. And here, Kanye is absolutely right. You know, that that's completely true. But what Kanye's anti-Semitic tweets have done is made it much more difficult to talk about this subject. For example, the $2 billion that Kushner received from Saudi Arabia, uh, his various dirty deals uh, with Gutter, with Israel, and so on. Those dirty deals should absolutely be examined, as should his long history with Kanye. You know, that history, the history of the two of them, has been curiously left out of a lot of discussions. So I want to remind everyone that in 2020, Kushner and Kanye were so close that they were speaking on the phone almost every single day. And this was reported in a, a multitude of places, including Forbes, The New York Times, The Washington Post, um, and so on. This is not a, a spurious claim. What's happened since then? So I think maybe folks have forgot, but it's important to put this in context. So Forbes writes in August 2020, Kushner seems to have an outsized influence over West. Their relationship helped bring West and his wife, Kim Kardashian West, to the White House for an instantly famous Oval Office meeting, and they collaborated on ideas for sentencing reform. I'm just going to interject here by saying that like Kushner's idea of sentencing reform is abusing the pardon power to bail out all of his criminal friends, uh, as well as his father. So, you know, any kind of uh, facade of interest in serious criminal justice reform should be uh, ignored when it comes to him. And so Forbes goes on to describe Kushner as exploiting Kanye West's mental state for political gain. And this is from the article. He's mentally ill, says a West friend. When you have people around him who have the best intentions and don't need anything from him, you can steer him when he's in that space into a positive place. When you have people around him who see him as an opportunity, they create a very, very bad scenario. And this is the article continuing. Some close to West feel that Kushner now falls into the latter camp in ways that flirt with exploitation, concerning after Kardashian West asked publicly for compassion and empathy. When described their understanding of Kushner's conversations with West as reverse psychology, others prescribe less malicious intent, 
though that narrative would require a level of naivete that would rank up there with sitting in a meeting at Trump Tower with Russians who promised to have dirt on Hillary Clinton. That's actually from the Forbes article. That, that's not me. Um, anyway, so uh, I will remind you that all of this was happening as Kanye West was running for president. Uh, you may remember this short-lived run. It seemed to be designed to take votes away from Democrats, uh, according to the Washington Post, uh, this was actually illegal because you had the candidate of one campaign in a very tight relationship um, with somebody managing another campaign, with Kushner, who of course was working on Trump's 2020 campaign. So that's the short version of their backstory. You should pay attention to these kind of uh, WWE style feuds, but never lose sight of who is getting hurt most in the process, which is right now every Jewish American facing an onslaught of hate rhetoric as a result of their words. And speaking of hate rhetoric, later that weekend, uh, we had a new post from Trump, which so far, uh, I believe no one in the Republican Party and very few in the Democratic Party have condemned, despite its overt hateful anti-Semitism. And so I'm going to read this um, little tweet type thing uh, from Trump, which he posted on his own network. Trump says, no president has done more for Israel than I have. Somewhat surprisingly, however, our wonderful evangelicals are far more appreciative of this than the people of the Jewish faith, especially those living in the U.S. Those living in Israel, though, are a different story. Highest approval rating in the world could easily be prime minister. U.S. Jews have to get their act together and appreciate what they have in Israel before it's too late. First things first, we have once again a threat against Jewish Americans. You should not play this down. The quote, Jews have to get their act together and appreciate what they have in Israel before it's too late, is a threat, complete with a demand, complete with a timeline. We also have a clear example of what is a recurrent theme in both Republican politics and in right-wing Israeli politics, which is demonizing Jewish Americans, most of whom vote for Democrats, in favor of Christian evangelicals, and most importantly, in favor of Israel. Trump has previously berated Jewish Americans for being loyal to the United States, It's basically an inverse of the dual loyalty trope. In Trump's view, Jewish loyalty should be to Israel first, even if you're an American. He backs the fanatical ethno-nationalism of his longtime friend Netanyahu, who is also a longtime friend of the Kushner family and who, much like Trump and Kushner, has been involved in a multitude of uh, criminal and corrupt acts. And so there are many reasons for this decades-long corrupt alliance. There's also a long history of Netanyahu stoking anti-Semitism against the liberal diaspora, whether in his alliance with Breitbart or his aid to other far-right Zionists in spreading the George Soros myth, uh, which BuzzFeed did a great expose on, on the origins of that, so we'll link to that in the show notes. And Netanyahu is now on a U.S. media tour. He was on Morning Joe this morning defending Trump's anti-Semitism. He was on Bill Maher's show uh, doing much of the same. So you have to kind of ask here, you know, why is the media giving him this platform? Why are they not condemning Trump? Why are our leaders not condemning what is an overtly anti-Semitic statement from Trump? Again, I want to emphasize this is a dangerous and profoundly unfair situation for Jewish Americans. And so it's remarkable that more of our elected officials have not spoken out to condemn it. And what it shows is that they too, some of them at least, value the foreign state of Israel over their fellow Americans. They value Israel over Jewish Americans who need protection from bigoted fanatics right now. And so it's not really surprising to hear silence from the GOP, you know, who have always backed or tolerated Trump's hateful positions. But it's also worth noting the positions of leading Democrats when it comes to Israel, because it's extreme. It's not just, you know, a kind of friendship or, you know, a support of a partner state. The leaders of the party have put Israel before the U.S. Chuck Schumer told The New Yorker that God had chosen him to be in the Senate for the purpose 
of protecting Israel. Um, we'll link to that article as well, because uh, a lot of folks have doubt on that one. Nancy Pelosi uh, infamously proclaimed in December 2018 while sitting side by side with mega donor Haim Saban at a fundraiser that, and I quote, if the Capitol crumbled to the ground, the one thing that would remain would be our commitment to and cooperation with Israel. And as I've said before, that is a disturbing comment to make about any country, because one would assume that the first priority of a U.S. official would be to protect Americans and not uh, a foreign country. And it's notable here, I think, that this rhetoric on Israel and Schumer's rhetoric uh, often lines up with that of Trump. And that's certainly not true of um, you know everybody in the Democratic Party. And so you have to ask why. Uh, well, there are a lot of reasons. But one major one has been the role of APAC, um, the lobbyists and major funder of campaigns of both Democrats and Republicans. Since 2020, APAC has ramped up its funding of insurrectionists and bigots, even when those candidates espouse anti-Semitic beliefs or align themselves with anti-Semitic causes. APAC just spent $27 million in the Democratic primaries trying to defeat candidates who believe in Palestinian rights, but they only succeeded in defeating Andy Levin, a progressive former synagogue leader from Michigan, whom they felt needed to be ousted for his belief that Palestinians deserve to be treated humanely. So again, they don't care about the fate of Jewish Americans. They care about Israel. And if that means backing people who tried to overthrow the government or who float the, quote, great replacement theory, then they'll do that. That's what they're doing now. Currently, APAC is funding over 100 Republicans who refused to certify Biden's election victory. You know, this is the financial muscle uh, or part of it behind that group. And so why are the Democrats not speaking out about this? Well, according to The Guardian, they are so afraid um, that they don't even want to publicly address their own fear. An anonymous Democratic staffer told The Guardian that they were not prepared to get in a public confrontation with the lobbyist group. And then here's a quote from the article. APAC is now an embarrassment, but frankly, it's too powerful to go up against, the staffer said. We don't need them pouring money in against us, so we hold off on public criticisms. My guess is that this is the same reason they're not condemning Trump, even when he's making threats against Jewish Americans. They are terrified of Israel and of APAC and of this big donor network and what they might do. And so this is a vile situation in so many ways. It is antithetical to democracy. It is antithetical to morality. All of this needs to be called out and condemned. The anti-Semitism, the alliances, the cowardice, and the corruption. And that is the uh, story of Kanye West, Trump, and the Republican Party. It's such a shame. <laughs> it really shame. is. It's just a nightmare. I mean, the whole theme of that tweet right like how did it go it was kanye elon trump. trump that's the big campaign slogan of republican fascists this election cycle kanye elon trump that's a very concise summary of this excellent must watch series on pbs right now called the u.s and the holocaust it is this extraordinary three-part series, which is available if you're in the U.S. I don't know how to watch it outside of the U.S., but if you're in the U.S., you could watch it for free on the PBS website. Just Google PBS and the U.S. and the Holocaust. It's by Ken Burns, Lynn Novick, and Sarah Botstein. It's such a extraordinary, detailed look at what the U.S. was doing and how the U.S. essentially enabled Hitler to build and carry out his mass murder machine. And all of the American celebrities, like Charles Lindbergh, of course, all of the American business titans, like Henry Ford, and all of the far out there American politicians, too many to name, who were staunchly anti 
immigration, who didn't want immigrants from so-called shithole countries, who only wanted white, Aryan, Northern European, Nordic immigrants to be allowed into the United States during a time of countless people, mostly Jewish people being forced from their homes because in places like Germany and Austria, they were being driven out of the homes they knew, their businesses attacked, physically vandalized, windows broken, uh, the beards of their spiritual leaders, the rabbis publicly chopped in front of everyone. The beard of a rabbi is a symbol of the spiritual authority that the community entrusts in that person. You'd have laws against driving. Jewish people were forbidden from doing all sorts of basic things. And it was just this chipping away at basic human dignity. And on top of that, if they wanted to flee all this from Germany, the Nazis imposed restrictions, severe restrictions, on how much money Jewish people could take with them to flee the country and start a new life abroad somewhere. It was just horrific cruelty. And all of the details, and I'm only listing a few, are heartbreakingly, powerfully shown in this three-part series, The U.S. and the Holocaust on PBS. Everyone is morally obligated to watch this, to understand where we are now and how extremely dangerous it is now. All the signs are there. You have these influential people, these powerful people across business and culture who have been co-opted into this uh, anti-Semitic, pro-fascist, pro-genocidal thinking. Some of them do the propaganda more delicately than others. Kanye, for instance, is just a straight up, I don't even know, like he's just, he's just going for it. He just, he's just being openly anti-Semitic now. Like it's always been there, but now he's just letting it rip. Elon Musk is trying to play both sides. He's not, he's doing it poorly, of course, but it's very, very clear. And Russian analysts who are experts on understanding Putin's mind, like Fiona Hill, have been pointing out that Elon Musk is very clearly communicating messages to the West, to Ukraine, of what Putin wants, negotiating on behalf of Putin and pushing all that. That's happening in real time. And I want to point out the significance of that because Putin is at war, Russia is at war with not just Ukraine. Russia has very clearly stated again and again that they're at war with the West. They're at war with democracy, wherever democracy exists in the world. Democracy must fail and fascism, mafia states must prevail. Russia is part of an axis of these kleptocratic states, along with North Korea, Iran, Assad, Syria, Venezuela. They're propping a lot of these failed dictatorships up financially with military support and so on. They're friends with Netanyahu, who wants to turn Israel into an autocracy. They're openly proud of creating this new axis of autocrats. They're a coalition which we should really take as a lesson, as an important reminder of how essential coalitions are to winning any sort of battle. And so the the dictators and the wannabe dictators are openly, proudly in a coalition. And they have all of their useful idiots from Elon Musk to Kanye co-opted as part of this effort to normalize the unjustifiable. And it's all happening before our eyes. And it's just going to get worse if we don't have a more meaningful reaction to stop them. The help we're giving to Ukraine isn't enough. It's simply not enough. And it's about to get weaker if, God forbid, the fascist Republicans who have been completely taken over are aligned with uh, Putin's Russia, with Russian fascism. It's a combination of homegrown Republican fascism, the same kind that inspired the Nazis, the Jim Crow laws, the strict anti-immigration laws, the forced mass deportation of non-white people from the U.S., all those things, all the, the legal apparatuses, all of those inspired Hitler. Hitler liked the U.S. when Hitler was coming to power. He was a fan of the U.S., the Republicans, the Mitch McConnells of the day. And he used the lessons from America, what America was doing uh, against non-white people, uh, to carry out uh, his dictatorship in Germany, to build it all, to pass these laws, taking away daily dignity, daily human rights from Jewish people, and build his killing machine. So it's all coming back History is repeating. History is repeating because we don't learn from history. History is repeating because we've had a far right, um, libertarian led, extremist Republican led 
movement over the past several decades in America to attack intellectualism, to attack schools um, from kindergarten on up to the university level, uh, to bring in a dumbing down of America, as we've seen with this far right propaganda takeover from Fox News, Newsmax, One America Network, Sinclair gobbling up local TV stations. And, And on top of that, just like you had during the rise of the Nazis, you have a bunch of capitalists cashing in on this with the hedge funds destroying newsrooms and investigative journalism units are the first to go because they're the most expensive. And that's a further weakening of public discourse of of anti-corruption watchdogs, of reformers, of communities. So there's been a lot of people that have been cashing in on the decline of all this and setting the stage over decades for fascism to finally take hold in America. And we're at an extremely dangerous tipping point for not just our country, but the world. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're at the culmination of a lot of trends that grew to the point that that Trump was able to get into office, that Brexit happened, that Putin felt comfortable invading Crimea in 2014, not expecting backlash, and he didn't really get it in a meaningful way. And then all of this was laid out on the table very explicitly in front of us in 2016. You know, all the hypotheticals became real. The axis of autocrats was spelled out. Um, you know, the more that people investigated these kind of key players in this nexus, you know, whether Trump or Kushner, the more corruption and the more, you know, decades long entanglements were revealed. You know, I'd add Manafort and Stone um, and others to that list as well. You know, so you could see the way that Israel and Russia were working together, for example. Um, you know, I was just sharing with you privately this morning, remembering how Netanyahu uh, was the person who helped bring Trump and Putin together for the Helsinki Health Summit, um, you know, back in 2018. But those alliances go back longer. And so what we had over the last, you know, I guess six years was an opportunity to air all of this out and to try to rectify it and to try to strengthen alternative alliances, alliances with democratic countries, you know, in countries that were trying uh, to preserve their democracies under threat. You know, I would put the UK in that category, I'd put us in that category, where you see kleptocratic operations gaining um, and and gradually stomping out democracy over time. We have not done that in the US. You know, the last two years were the best opportunity that we had with the Democrats having the presidency, the House, and the Senate. There are obviously um, maneuvers in play that had been planned for decades on end. For example, the packing of the Supreme Court and the ability of an ultra-right-wing Supreme Court um, to overrule uh, a lot of domestic policy decisions. But nonetheless, you know, you it's like the basic, the most basic lessons have not been learned, you know, which is do not give in to dictators, do not make financial deals with dictators. They're learning that the hard way with um, Saudi Arabia. Always expose corruption, get dark money out of politics, take uh, you know bigotry and hate rhetoric seriously, treat it equally across the board. Like whoever makes the threat, it's the threat that matters. It's who gets hurt that matters. It's who suffers in these situations and feels unprotected and vulnerable that matters. You know, we've had so many hate crimes over the last six years, such an incredible rise against Black Americans, against Asian Americans uh, during COVID, and, you know, really accelerating against Jewish Americans. So you would think that there would be just at the most basic level, an ability of uh, members of Congress and others to flat out condemn this, to when Trump says it, you know, think about his backers, think about his role as a demagogue, think about the kind of networks he taps into, and about the fact that, you know, he he very clearly is trying to separate Jewish Americans from Israel, claim basically his preference for Israel, and start some sort of battle that is you know, so dirty, so corrosive, so full of baseless innuendo, and also one that I think can be weaponized by people like Kushner and Netanyahu to try to discourage discussion of their own corruption by trying to, you know, put it into the, oh, you're being anti-Semitic basket, where, you know, the reality is we need to talk about an individual their actions, what they've done, you know, whether it served the American public, whether it betrayed the American public. And we also need to keep in mind this broader 
movement of hate rhetoric and attacks of physical violence against uh, ethnic minorities within the United States. You know, that's a complicated balance to maintain, uh, you know, when you're dealing with folks like Kushner um, and Trump that are very good at PR, that are very good at manipulating mass media, that have a foothold in networks like Fox, you know, in shows like Tucker Carlson that are uh, happy to produce the kind of narratives that they want. It's just deeply frustrating that folks had time to learn from all of the mistakes of the past six years, from the hesitancy, the refusal to see what's right in front of them. And I feel like there's just an embrace of fascism. It's like America went through the five stages of grief, and instead of staying at anger, which is where they should have stayed when dealing with an autocratic threat, they've decided to move to acceptance. They've decided to find some way of rationalizing it. And here I don't mean the majority of Americans, but I do mean many of the Americans that hold positions of power in politics, in media, in corporations, um, you know, the ones who will set the tone uh, for the rest of us, you know, ordinary folks who don't, um, you know, we, we can't throw our weight around as much, especially since, uh, you know, voting rights and other rights are, under threat. Um, you see it in the entertainment industry, even. You know, you see all these layoffs uh, where it's, uh, you know, mostly non-white uh, show creators and writers and often a lot of women, you know, getting sidelined, similar layoffs in journalism. Some of the atmosphere reminds me of 2002, you know, when America was so traumatized by 9-11 that they were kind of willing to accept a lot of autocratic measures that they shouldn't have as they were hit with a propaganda blitz. So things like the war in Iraq, the Patriot Act, um, you know, it did get scrutiny from people, but those people were dismissed as either hysterical or alarmist, or sometimes even as traitors, as unpatriotic. I'm seeing that same sort of let's just give in kind of vibe, like let's just give in to the white patriarchal structure. Like, let's stop fighting these battles because I think this is part of it. People aren't fighting for us. Our officials aren't fighting for us. People aren't doing their most basic duty, whether it's, you know, Merrick Garland or, or Christopher Ray or Biden in terms of uh, not firing Merrick Garland, Christopher Ray, Louis DeJoy, and, and all of these others. Uh, the opposition has grown quiet. And I think it's in part because of trauma, but it's also because of, of lack of support and this kind of ceaseless onslaught of threats and hateful, violent behavior. And people need to take all these issues that we're talking about and boil them down to the politics, the, the elections, the elections happening right now. For instance, we have a massive number of listeners in New York State. And I want to just share that a new poll uh, shared by good old Steve Kornacki from the polls from Quinnipiac. <laughs> my, my, yeah, there you go. Uh, they have Governor Kathy Hochul up only four points over Republican Lee Zeldin. Only four points. Lee Zeldin, who has been endorsed by Trump right after Trump made his anti-Semitic uh, post. Yeah. And then Siena, the Siena poll had Hochul up only by 11 points, which those averages, that's not very comfortable for us here in New York State, which is supposed to be a blue bastion against uh, the fascist takeover of our country. What's really interesting, back to the PBS U.S. and the Holocaust documentary, New York City, Brooklyn, uh, kept coming up as a big Antifa, anti-fascist hotbed against uh, America's homegrown Nazi movement against the whole America first crowd and the isolationists and the, the fake anti-imperialist pacifists and all of it. You had New Yorkers being badass and speaking truth to power. And that included sneaking onto a, a ship which was set to go to Germany and ripping off the Nazi flag and getting arrested. That also included swarming the big Nazi rally in Madison Square Garden on George Washington's birthday, where they had these big banners of George Washington and the place was just packed full of Proud Boys and Roger Stones of the day. And outside, the New Yorkers just gathered and harassed and screamed and just disrupted the events as much as they could. So we need New York to be blue. We need strong democratic leadership in this state. And this is a reminder that if you're terrified about all the stuff we talk about on the show, you need to look where you live 
and make sure that you are represented by good governance wherever you are. Pay attention to who is representing you where you live. Fight like hell to clean up your community. Get involved locally in your community. Go to gaslitnationpod.com and go to our 2022 survival guide. And there's a whole long list of ways that you can help turn the tide and protect what's left of our democracy from a full-blown fascist takeover. They have been very clear on what they want to do. The crimes are being committed out in the open. This has been a long-term plan. We did a big old series in the spring talking to all sorts of historians and other experts about the generations of work that has gone into getting us here. And now they're reaping what they've sowed. It's harvest time for the fascists. We're about Mm -hmm. to enter the Supreme Court season, right? Which now feels like Hunger Games, where the Supreme Court is going to be further chipping away and and landmark decisions and taking away our democracy before our very eyes, scapegoating people through the legal system. Um, So this is real. It's happening. So the thing you need to do is, as much as we all want to curl up in a little ball, we all feel that way. Despair is a very healthy and normal reaction to all this, but don't stay in your despair too long. That's something that this work has taught me again and again. Do not succumb to your despair don't wallow in your despair. You can do whatever you can to self-heal, to get out of bed in the morning, You know, look into your child's eyes, just give yourself a reason to fight and cling to whatever joy you have in your life and get oxygen in your lungs and your mind. But you need to get out there and fight. We desperately need you. We cannot do this alone. So please lock arms with us and help us get out the vote. We've laid it all out there on what to do and where to start. Own your power. Do not let them fool you into thinking you're powerless because that's simply not true. And the existence of this show is a reminder of that. We remind ourselves of that every single day. We're all about taking back our our power from people who have genocidal aims and genocidal maniacs do not stop at their targets, right? Because they're what's at the heart of it is mass murder. There's just something wrong with these people. They're wired Mm. differently. So the whole point of human civilization, the way we've even managed to get this far is setting up all sorts of systems and protecting those systems from people that would do us harm, from the bad guys that are real, that exists out there. So all of us need to fight like hell right now because we have simply no other choice. Yeah, absolutely. And as a sort of final point, it's very frustrating and it does cause feelings of depression, feelings of despair to see institutions collapsing around us, to see this level of betrayal or inertia. Um, So I just want to emphasize to people that in times like this, what you can always hold on to is your own moral clarity. And it's essential to do that now in the midst of all this overt bigotry, all of these threats, all of this hate rhetoric, beyond just the structural threats, you know, we're seeing interpersonal threats as well. Your moral clarity, you know, uh, your sense of ethics, your sense of compassion and empathy, that is something that no official, no dictator, no one can take away from you unless you let them. That is a choice that you always have, no matter how much things are crumbling around you. And so it's absolutely uh, essential to hold on to that part of yourself now. Never relinquish it. Never give up. Always uh, you know, follow your heart and your own conception of what is right and wrong. Do not go along with the crowd in this sort of situation. You know, we've seen what has happened in the past and you should learn from that history. Our discussion continues and you can get access to that by signing up on our Patreon at the truth teller level or higher. Pakistan has been decimated by record floods and people need help. To help victims of the floods, donate to Pakistan Emergency Flood Aid at www.launchgood.com slash campaign slash Pakistan underscore emergency underscore flood underscore aid. Climate and economic crises are everywhere, so continue supporting your local food bank as well. We encourage you to help support Ukraine by donating to Rosam for Ukraine at rosamforukraine.org. We also encourage you to donate to the International Rescue Committee, a humanitarian relief organization helping refugees from Syria, Ukraine, and Afghanistan. Donate at rescue.org. 
And if you want to help critically endangered orangutans already under pressure from the palm oil industry, donate to the Orangutan Project at theorangutanproject.org. Gaslit Nation is produced by Sarah Kenzier and Andrea Chalupa. If you like what we do, leave us a review on iTunes. It helps us reach more listeners. And check out our Patreon. It keeps us going. Our production manager is Nicholas Torres, and our associate producer is Carlin Daigle. Our episodes are edited by Nicholas Torres, and our Patreon-exclusive content is edited by Carlin Daigle. Original music in Gaslit Nation is produced by David Whitehead, Martin Bissenberg, Nick Farr, Damian Ariaga, and Carlin Daigle. Our logo design was donated to us by Hamish Smith of the New York-based firm Order. Thank you so much, Hamish. Gaslit Nation would like to thank our supporters at the producer level on Patreon and higher. Jess Sauer. Chick Quinn. Lily Wachowski. Sean Rubin. Todd Perlstein. Kenny Main. John Schoenthaler. Ellen McGirt. Joel Farron. Larry Gassan. Erica Moore. Karen A. Deal. Nico Phillips. Brian E. Castor, Tatjana Birch, Karen Heisler, Ann Bertino, Chris Bravo, T.R. Dunstan, John Millett, David East, Stu, Ida, Ben Wheaton, Joseph Mara Jr., Rich Holcomb, Thomas Scheibe, Kelsey Malsom, Julie Matthews, Meganopolis, Barbara Kittredge, Matthew Womack, Silas Frank, Sean Berg, Kristen Custer, Tracy Ash, Kai Gillis, Sharon Hatrick, Ed Snowden's Russian Passport, <laughs> William Barry Reeves, Richard Smith, Emmy, Kevin Gannon, Mike Christensen, Sandra Collins, Katie Masuris, John Laughlin, James D. Leonard, Leo Chalupa, Carol Golstad, Michael Woldridge, Jason Benke, Marcus J. Trent, Joe Darcy, Ann Marshall, Jeremy Lewis, Joel Newman, Trigvi, D.L. Singfield, Matt Perez, Nicole Spear, Brian Tejudin, Maureen Murphy, Abby Road, Jans Alstrup Rasmussen, Victoria Olson, ZW, Lisa LaFlame, Kathy Cavanaugh, Sarah Gray, Mike Tripico, Diana Galher, Jennifer Ann Luter, John Ripley, Ethan Mann, David Porter, Kate Cotton, Leah Campbell, Lynn Schneider, Jared Lombardo, Karen Humphreys, and Marshall, and Tanya Chalupa. Thank you all for your support of the show. We could not make Gaslit Nation without you. Thank you. Thank you.